The depot was a it was a mess in the early 1980s. Um, you know, being all boarded up, it was falling down. Um, sometimes, you know, the building was wide open, so we'd have to close the doors. Many of the doors were busted and had holes in them. Um, so it, it was an issue, and, and part of the problem we have on one hand, uh, we tried to work with Conrail to address the issue, and on the other hand, by doing that, they talked about tearing down the depot. Although listed on the National Register in 1976 and once part of the most extensive railroad shops and yards in the country, the Denison Depot was in a state of serious deterioration by 1980. A devastating railroad strike in the 1920s, followed by the introduction of diesel engines and the expansion of travel by automobiles and airplanes, led to the demise of the Denison Yards. The depot, once the site of 22 passenger trains a day, was heading straight toward demolition. As a child growing up a few blocks away from here, my father used to tell us, my brothers and us, that if we were caught here after dusk, we would get our butt beat because this was a very blighted area. Uh, you know, the depot was run down, but we also had a, probably a half a dozen bars that existed on Center Street. A lot of them that were, you know, created back in the heydays of the railroad town. And, and it was a very difficult place. We had policemen who got hurt, throw it out windows and wouldn't even answer calls into this area. Our history in this, in this town is all railroad. Uh, everybody I knew growing up basically was a railroad or a clay worker. So the whole history was wrapped around. The depot is also the center part of the community. So with the deterioration of the depot, and you know, we had to do something because basically we were losing the center part of our community from the deterioration here. So it was not only the idea of saving the depot and bringing and preserving the history and telling the, the great story of the railroad that took place here, the history of it as well as the canteen but it also was reinventing our community by saving this historical treasure we have. Denison uh, actually was founded as a railroad town. Uh, the Pennsylvania Railroad was, uh, as were many railroads in, in the middle 1800s, were aggressively building lines westward towards the, the Midwest and Chicago. And uh, the Steubenville and Indiana Railroad was uh, chartered in 1848 and was controlled right from the start by the Pensy. It became popularly known as the Panhandle Road, and was, this was one of two main lines that the Pensy operated from Pittsburgh west. Uh, one ran from Pittsburgh to Chicago, and the Panhandle line ran from Pittsburgh to St. Louis. As they developed the railroad in the 1860s, the uh, Panhandle decided that they would main their, make their main division point uh, at a midway point between Pittsburgh and Columbus, and founded Denison as a result. And by the late 1800s, this had become, or circa 1900, this had become the second largest servicing and, and shops facility that the Pensy owned outside of Altoona, Pennsylvania. They had roundhouses, locomotive and car shops, blacksmith shops, all kinds of servicing and, and facilities, and this station. So it really was a, a, a major point on one of the two major lines of a railroad that became popularly known as the Standard Railroad of, of America. It was the single largest railroad in the United States up through the Second World War or beyond. In the beginning, as you know, we. We put a study, the depot, uh, we looked at all the alternatives and we know that it had to sustain itself. We uh, knew we were going to have a museum in the depot. We had planned a restaurant to be located where the original restaurant was located. But we also at that time had planned a candy shop, a floral shop, and a gift shop in there that would be run from the museum. It's interesting, during the whole fundraising period, it started in late 1984 till we opened in 1989. Um, you know, there was a variety of different ideas, things changed, um, because the whole concept again was we could open a museum, but how would it pay for itself? I arrived in Denison in 1989, two months before the depot opened to the public. And I totally bought into Greg DiDonato's vision and the vision that his grassroots community uh, had put together for the depot. And I'd like to think it was a perfect match because this was a very passionate group uh, that, you know, was known as a town that wouldn't quit. 
and I was the type of person who could light a few fires and so I think we went together really well and we took this vision that Greg had created and ran with it and after the first phase of restoration we embarked on seven more phases and you know if I came to town and I had told people we need to raise five million dollars to restore this building I think I would have been tarred and feathered and ran out of town but we did it over time we did it together as a community and everybody became more and more involved and the, the depot became uh, more and more restored back to what it should have been in the first place. The railroads carried the burden all through the war. They, they pressed into use almost every piece of equipment, stuff that had been retired and was waiting on scrap lines was put back into use. They hauled uh, the, the great bulk of troop movements in the, in, within the borders of the U.S. were done by troop trains. At one point, they had a troop train starting a movement in the United States. I think it was once every six minutes. Uh, and every day, something like 200 troop trains were, were running throughout the U.S. On New Year's Eve, 1941, a lone woman stood by the Denison Depot platform watching the troop trains go by. When she saw the loneliness and fear on the soldiers' faces, she knew that something had to be done for these boys. And that's when Lucille Neustorfer went to work putting the Denison Servicemen's Canteen into motion. This started in my Uncle Elias Robinson's shoe shop. He, he uh, went as an apprenticeship there in the shop, originally across the alley from the uh, filling station. Then when he built his big shop, uh, uh, he built a big harness and shoe repair and sh shoe shining stand shop across on cent it went clear to Center Street and clear back to the alley. So he moved over there and then my Aunt Phyllis Robinson Bender was the Justice of the Peace. So he, she uh, went in there and was in there for a number of years till they did away with the JPs. <laughs> But we would take food over and give it to soldier trains when they pulled in up in the upper end of Center Street. And everybody just went along with it. Before we knew it, we moved into Phil's office. And uh, she had so much business and all. And finally, she says, I can't have this all going on in here. I have to conduct a business. So I went over to my uncle. I said, Uncle Elias, what's the matter with that filling station of Charlie Lindsay? It's empty. Do you suppose he'd let us have that to do our work for the soldiers? He said, I'll see about it right away. And he called Charlie. Charlie says, yes, they can have it right away. So we went over and cleaned it up and started in business then. Well, then when the war broke, we handled it all till the war broke. And I went up to the south. I was playing for a big show for the hospital and uh, on a Monday night. And uh, on a Tuesday, I had my husband take me up to the Salvation Army because I knew from the amount of soldiers we were serving that when the war broke and the ones going overseas and, and going from camp to camp, we could never, we had to have somebody could get it in line like the Salvation Army. Well, then it was inconvenient in so many ways. We had to come through the upper end of the depot there where all those carts are, and you had to carry coffee pots and add trays with your sandwiches and cookies on it. And uh, so I thought to myself, well, there's that Denison Depot. It's been idle all this time, and, and I, when Irvy and I were down here and we went in and talked to Johnny Hildebrand. And he was the one that worked here and they run the switchboard and handled all the calls. And uh, I said, Johnny, how could I get hold of Mr. Weisgarver the, over in Pittsburgh? He says, I'll put you through to him right away. So he called on the line. It, it was up that end of the depot and he said, uh, the, they wanted to know who it was, and I told them, I said, uh, I'm uh, Bert Neighbor's daughter from Denison. 
and I told what I wanted, and she put me right on to uh, Mr. Weisgarber, right? And uh, he ta talked to me, and I told him who I was, and he was a good friend of my dad's. And uh, he says, you'll have that depot right away. America's railroads mobilized in a sustained all-out nation's war effort. At the height of the war, a special troop train movement started somewhere in the U.S. every six minutes. More than 200 troop trains operated daily throughout 1942 to 1943, in addition to the large number of troops moved in regular passenger trains. On average, nearly one million troops per month were moved by rail. Here was the problem during World War II with troops traveling on trains. You had six to 800 soldiers on a train and the military couldn't feed them. If you used every dining car that you had, you still didn't have enough. You couldn't possibly stop the trains to feed them in restaurants or in depots along the way. So how do you feed 600 to 800 soldiers at a time? This is a huge logistical problem because you have to have soldiers who are healthy and well fed. And so the military realized that they needed to partner with the railroads and create canteens. And most of these were on the track side. And the, the canteens became a very important part of the home front effort to boost morale and to get the community engaged in the war and to feed the soldiers. It was a very practical uh, need for these canteens. I got to witness, you know, one train right after another. In fact, the first time I ever worked here, uh, the first train that came in, I'm sure that it was between six or eight hundred, and we were cleaned out, and the phone rang, and there was uh, I recall the number of 600. I remember that. And the next train, an hour later, uh, was on its way. And we, this operation was very well organized. Yeah, everybody got in a line. One uh, got the bread ready, and, and you had it in your hands like this. And by the time you turned around, there was meat on it, and you were slapping it together. And they were putting it in an envelope in a bag. And if you were lucky enough to have cookies or donuts, that also went in the bag. During the 50th anniversary of World War II, a gentleman came to the museum to make a donation to our historical collection. And what he brought was a sandwich bag. And he had received this at the canteen, and if you think about it, kept it throughout his tour of duty, wherever he was overseas, brought it home, and kept it for 50 more years, and then made a trip back to Denison to give it back. I think that there is not a better tribute that a soldier could make to show the impact that these women at the canteen had on the soldiers' lives. There was no scarcity. There was. Even though sugar was scarce, people took their sugar and made cookies and everything they could think about. And uh, we always had plenty, had plenty of money to buy everything and everybody just went out of their way to do what they needed to do to get the job done. The Denison Canteen operated from March 19, 1942 to April 8, 1946 under the direction of the Salvation Army and 4,000 volunteers, primarily women from an eight-county area. I used to work on Tuesday night with my sister and Mr. and Mrs. Clifford Weiss from Sugar Creek always had, that was their night. And um, they wouldn't allow you to fix anything for the boys. The Sugar Creek people sent all the food that their uh, group served. They brought all the food themselves. They would be big rolls of cheese. Oh, they had everything for them boys. The farmers that had orchards, especially in the fall, would uh, they'd say, well, we can't give you money, we can't give you this, but we will give you bushels of apples. Well, that was just as welcome as anything else. And you just can't imagine, uh, I don't know that anybody ever refused anything that we ever asked for. Maybe they wouldn't give us as much as we needed, but every, you know, a little bit from a lot of people really made a big difference. As the, the movement of troops increased, and, and uh, these, these were often long trips for these troops. A lot of times, a lot of these fellows were the first time they were away from home, coming out of Depression America. Uh, it, long night and day trips, uh, these trains were crowded. These fellows were often kind of homesick, away from home for the first time. And in support of these troops, uh, canteens kind of sprang up around the country, often through local initiative. Uh, 
uh, Denison is a prime example of that. And in fact, it became the, the, one of the three largest canteens in, in terms of troops served in the, in the history of the country. But all across the country, uh, there was over more than 100, uh, in the neighborhood of 125 canteens established uh, through the course of the Second World War. Uh, some of them were platform canteens, such as Denison. Some of them were operated by USOs in larger stations in major cities like New York City and Chicago or Philadelphia. Uh, and the point was to give the troops a bit of a break when the trains would stop, particularly at a division point like Denison, where the train would stop for a little longer time for engine or crew changes. It gave people time uh, to have coffee, uh, food for the troops. They could get off the train and volunteers uh, night or day. Uh, didn't matter what time of the day or night the train came through, there were people here to give a little bit of relief to the troops, give them a little touch of home, make them a little more aware of how their efforts were appreciated and the sacrifices they were undertaking. More than 1.3 million soldiers were served, and the canteen became so well known and appreciated nationwide the town was popularly known among the military forces as Dreamsville, USA. Denison earned the nickname Dreamsville, USA from the soldiers themselves that they served during World War II. And there are two theories of why they got that nickname. The first one can be explained if you put yourself in the shoes of a soldier and you're leaving the farm for the very first time. People didn't travel as much then as we do today. Going off to a country you probably never heard of, on a train that's very crowded, very hot, there's no air conditioning, you have no money in your pocket uh, for food, you're afraid, you, you're going to war, it's very scary and you don't know if you're coming home. So you have that mindset and you pull into a little town like Denison, Ohio, which reminds you of your hometown, and you see pretty girls that remind you of your mom, your sister, your sweetheart, giving you free food. The fact that someone cared that much about them was like a dream come true to them, and that's one theory of why Denison was called Dreamsville, USA. The second theory is that in 1939, there was a popular song called Dreams of Ohio. It was made popular by uh, Glenn Miller. And in this song, it talks about this idyllic respite from the troubles of the, wo of the world and this nice, uh, friendly community. And we think that soldiers picked up on that song and, and added that to the care and love that they were receiving in Denison. And it all came together to make Denison Dreamsville, USA. Won't you come with me to Dreamsville, Ohio? There's no better place to dream. There's a one when we, I met fellows that came in our outfit that uh, had came through Denison, stopped at the canteen, they were hungry and tired and said uh, that that was Dreamsville, Ohio to them. And, uh, I don't know where it originally got its name, but evidently somebody else had told them to. You'll know the sweetest moment you'll ever know. Mostly my emphasis was looking at the soldiers and sailors as they got off the train and thinking how nice looking they were. So in order to somehow get my name or, or some involvement, I was busy with the magazines that were piled up inside uh, to hand out to the men if they would take them. And I was busy putting my name and address inside the magazines. Did you ever hear from anybody as a response to that? I never heard from anybody. <laughs> <laughs> well, my sister worked down here. She's a few years older than I am. And she, she worked off and on. And the young girls always, you know, thought the boys were special. So they wanted to do something. And they weren't allowed to, to uh, give them their names or put them in the sandwiches or anything, but they used to put magazines down here. And they didn't care what they did with the magazines. So she put her name and address in a magazine. And they gave it, passed them out. And this fella, there were four, four boys, and they got a magazine with her name in it. Well, they... Other three, one of them was married and two of them had girlfriends, but this one fella didn't. So they said he could have the name, so he started to write to her. And they wrote back and forth, and she joined the waves. And they wrote all during the war. After the war, he still wrote to her, and he would call her up. He was from New York. Well, 
he finally called her up and wanted to know if he could come to see her. And she said, yeah. So I think it was, must have been May. I know it was warm weather. He came over to see her and they went down to the jewelry store and he bought her a diamond. And they were married in June, the, I forget what day, the last of June sometime. When uh, this big troop train come by, these boys were all looking out the window and they were, uh, I thought they must be from Texas. They were so tall, you know, and happy-go-lucky. I, and they said, I don't think you will fit, want to feed us. We're not from Ohio. I says, where are you from? He says, we're from Texas. I says, aren't you Americans? This is sure. I says, we'll be proud to serve you, and we did. They, they were thrilled to pieces. They couldn't believe it. I, though, handed out the sandwiches like this. And these young men running off of the trains coming in with their hands out. I've told many people, I never saw a face. My own husband could have been there and I wouldn't have known him because all I saw was hands. When you talk to the women who worked at the canteen, one particular story that stands out is the story of hands, uh, of all the soldiers running off the train in the five minutes that the train took on water and then just grabbing food, grabbing coffee, ga grabbing sandwiches uh, because they had to hurry. And in that process, some of the women will tell you that they very much remember soldiers grabbing onto their hands just a little bit longer and holding onto their hands for support. As many as 125 canteens and USO lounges were open to feed the soldiers on their long journeys to training camps and embarkation ports. Approximately 45 were stationed platform canteens run by volunteers. And it is those that stand out in the national memory and in the memories of the servicemen they served. One of the uh, criteria for, for being a National Historic Landmark is that it, it has to be uh, of national significance and it has to be one of the best surviving examples uh, that represents whatever theme and history that, it, that it's associated with. In the case of deep uh, canteens and canteens in general, uh, there's, Denison is the best surviving example in the country. The, it was the third largest canteen in the country. The other two were at Omaha and New York City. Both of those are gone. Ohio had at least 12 other uh, can, smaller canteens scattered across the state, a number of them on the Pensy. All of those are gone. There's nothing left now. Denison still remains, and it not only played a major and significant role in, in wartime history, in American history, but it still retains that integrity that, that a, a troop train pulling in today, I think the fellows getting off it would still recognize they were in Dreamsville, USA. You know, really in the beginning, we knew that this wasn't about just the history of railroad. We also knew the canteens was a significant part of our history. Uh, when you serve a million point three servicemen here during World War II, you realize the impact that you had on um, touching the people who served in World War II. So, you know, this is just a great honor has been bestowed on this county and this area and community. And, and you know, it's also the right thing we did, you know. Uh, America needs to also remember its history, and this depot played a major part in the national history, especially with the canteens. And also, you know, again, railroading, it's, it's amazing. Kids today don't, you know, say something about railroading, have very little understanding what railroad was. So even as a child, at least I recognize and I realize what railroading was. So for future generations, uh, I think it's important to be able to still tell the story, but it's, it's a great honor. Um, I don't think any of us, again, would have ever believed that we would be today, uh, would be recognized as a national landmark.